Let's get into the top 10. Number 10, Kawhi Leonard. Now, uh, to be clear, he's not the 10th best player in the league. He's probably much higher than that if he is healthy. But in this case, I felt like this was a smart place to put him or a safe place to put him that applies the appropriate respect to what he's done in this league while giving favor to the players in front of him who have been more impactful lately because of their health. And availability is absolutely an ability. But I do believe that people have massively overlooked... I, should, I shouldn't put it that way. I think that all, collectively... As a basketball community, we've kind of forgotten a little bit just how damn good Kawhi Leonard is. So these are his stats from the 2021 season, uh, the year before he got hurt, obviously. Or the year that he did get hurt, I should say. 25-7-5 and five on 62% true shooting in the regular season. In the playoffs, 38-4 and four on 68% true shooting. These numbers that I'm about to read you guys are just preposterous. Everything that you've heard from me in the last couple weeks as we've done these player rankings pales in comparison to the numbers that I'm about to read to you. 4.2 made restricted area field goal attempts at 77%. Like I said, for a big power wing, I want that around 70 on the low end. He's at 77%. That's damn near a rim finisher like a guy, fin- uh, like a big man in the dunker spot. 2.3 additional paint field goals at 49%. That's incredible. 2.9, may, or excuse me, 2.5 made mid-range jump shots per game on 66% shooting. That's outrageously good. That's unconscionably good. That doesn't even make sense. There's that, That's so unbelievably deadly from that range that it, should t- it takes every analytical argument and just throws it out the window. 44% on corner threes and 39% on above the break threes. Just outrageously efficient. He scored on 58% of his post-ups. By the way, all these numbers I'm reading are from the postseason. These were from playoff series. He scored on 58% of his post-ups, resulting in 1.21 points per possession. He took 81 pull-up jump shots off the dribble in that postseason run and made 40 of them, damn near half. He's just absolutely insanely good. And I'm very, very excited to watch him play basketball again this year. You know, one of the things that I wanted to hit on here is the value of strength in basketball because Kawhi Leonard is an extremely strong player. Uh, I had a a foot injury after my freshman season in junior college. Uh, My first season in junior college, I was about 205 pounds and uh, freaky athlete, like get my head at the rim. I was, I I was above the rim all the time, but I struggled to get to the rim as a slasher because I was pretty thin. So I suffered a stress fracture in that off season and I had to take a couple of months off. And during that time, all I did was lift weights every single day. And I went into my second season at 225 pounds. So I'd add literally 20 pounds of muscle in one single off season. And I ended up making an all conference team that year. And a large part of that was the value of strength. It made me a much better rebounder. It made me a much better uh, uh, defensive player. And it made it so that when I was driving to the basket, I had an easier time maintaining my line, staying where staying where I was as opposed to people bumping me off my line. I think people, basketball players in general, are obsessed with keeping their weight down for the sake of mobility. And I do understand that. Don't get me wrong. Like there is a balance here. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this is Andre Gudala. He talks all the time. I think he he plays around 220 as well. And like he talks about how like 222 is about the high end of where he feels like he can be an impactful defender, but he's actually more comfortable about 220. And he makes the decision to get up to 222 when he has to guard LeBron James in a playoff series because he needs the extra weight. It was from, I think, one of his books a while back. But it's an interesting concept. There is a balance. There's a, there's a healthy balance between strength and carrying extra weight and keeping your mobility. But I think strength is vastly become one of the most underrated skills in the game of basketball. And there are not enough young players putting attention to detail into their strength training. Think of it like this. Every time you do anything on a basketball court, there's contact. Basketball is a contact sport. You are not just running free and loose all over the floor. People are grabbing you. People are holding you. People are trying to get in your way. People are fighting you for position. And in those situations, every little bit of muscle that you have is, is an extra ability to fight and claw for position. When you rip through and try to go to the rim, if a guy does a little bit of hand checking, which is probably not going to get called, it might be the difference between him containing you and keeping you in front and you ripping right through him and getting all the way to the rim. It's an immensely valuable skill, and it's one of the great reasons why Kawhi Leonard is so, so successful on the basketball court. He can get to any spot he wants on the floor. 
I've talked about this before ages ago, so a lot of you guys who have gotten onto the show recently won't remember this, but Kawhi Leonard uniquely with his fadeaway uses his strength to get easy shots. You know, I always talk about the difference between making extremely difficult shots versus working really hard to get easy shots. You know, you'll see guys like Steph Curry do this by moving without the basketball. You'll see LeBron James do this by quick duck-ins and seals around the basket to get easy layups. For Kawhi Leonard, it, you see it in his mid-range game. When he is working you uh, from the perimeter into the lane and he's got you on his hip, he'll give you a hard bump with his right shoulder and then rise up from 17 feet. It's a wide open shot, even though he was guarded, because he's so damn strong that he bumped you off. With his fadeaway, I've talked about this before, there's two different kinds of fadeaway jump shooters. Fadeaway jump shooters who do it with their athleticism and fadeaway jump, jump shooters that do it with their strength. A guy like LeBron, ironically, does it with his athleticism. He fades wildly away from the basket, almost like comically on his fadeaway. Kawhi Leonard, it's like a hard bump with his shoulder before he turns and it's almost straight up and down. But that's why he's so deadly from that range. His fadeaway is not a difficult jump shot. It is a short, balanced, easy, open jump shot that he gets to by using his strength to work you to a spot on the floor where he's comfortable and then bumping you off with one of his big ass shoulders and getting up into his spot or getting up into his shot. And then that strength obviously continues to help you on the defensive end when you're the guy who's applying that physicality to the person that you're guarding. Moral of the story here, work on your strength. It, like it is just it, like there's a fine line. You want to make sure that you're mobile and that you can cover the ground that you need to. But if you're a young basketball player, do not overlook the weight room. It's a very, very important part of the game. Um, he's a dominant defensive player still, even though he's not quite what he was. But that's to be expected as he became, you know, he was a defensive player of the year once, but that was in an era when he was not being used as much offensively. But still in high leverage moments, he can be a huge problem there. We even saw that as he made, obviously he can't shut down Luka, but he's made in his last two playoff runs where he went up against Luka Doncic, there were stretches of those series where he put, he got onto Luka, made things extremely difficult and had some success there. On the playmaking front, he used to be pretty much the worst playmaking star in the entire league, like to the point where it was a glaring, glaring weakness. He's still in that conversation, but he has become respectable. Like he can make your basic pocket passes and pick and roll if you run drop coverage to him, or he can make basic kickouts. That is definitely a weakness of his, those, uh, though. And then health is obviously uh, a huge part of it as well. I've heard mixed intel on, Kawhi, uh, on Kawhi's knee. I've heard from people that would know that it's degenerative and it may never get better. And then I've heard people say that, you know, that, that, that that's BS and he's fine. As is always the case, Kawhi Leonard keeps such a, a tight circle that it's really difficult to get a feel for, uh, uh, for the truth coming out of uh, when it comes to reports on Kawhi. Um, we talked a little bit about the Clippers last year or last, uh, last show and involving their roster. But I do think this is an interesting kind of like, pivotal year for this era of Clippers basketball. We all think of the Lakers as the shit show and the Clippers as the team that have it together. And there's a lot of truth to that. The Clippers have a better owner that's willing to spend and that gets out of the way of basketball making decisions. That he accepts advice from people that know what they're talking about. The way that their roster is put together is extremely modern and forward thinking and well-rounded and versatile. And they've got a really good basketball coach. They are well run from the top down. But the reality is, is we've had three seasons of this battle for LA and the Lakers have one championship and the Clippers have zero. They, and you know, for all you want to say about the, 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 uh, for all you want to say about the, the unprofessionalism or whatever you want to say, the chaotic nature of the Lakers, they won a championship. And then they had another year that was successful despite injuries. And then they had this disaster. For the Clippers, they had an incredibly ugly, disappointing, blown 3-1 lead against the Denver Nuggets. And then they lost in the 2021 playoffs due to injuries. And they lost in the 2022 playoffs due to injuries. So the reality is, is that they have a big old bagel to show for their results, despite having, for their efforts, despite having a fantastic roster, as we've laid out before, at the guard position, they're stacked. Reggie Jackson, John Wall is a backup. Norman Powell is another small guard that can dribble drive. On the wing, they've got Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, Marcus Morris, Nicholas Batum, Robert Covington, Terrence Mann, Luke Kennard. Like, they are absolutely stacked there. And then they have a big guy, a solid big in Zubats that they can go to when they want to play traditional drop coverages and things along those lines. The pressure is on now. 
Because if Kawhi gets hurt again or Paul George gets hurt again, it's no longer a question of bad luck. It's a question of the reality of their bodies and the way that they hold up under the grind of the NBA season. Because Paul George has a consistent injury history and so does Kawhi Leonard. You have a roster completely stacked full of talent. You absolutely are a top-tier championship contender when you are healthy. You had three three shots and nothing has come from it. This is the year. Kawhi Leonard and Paul George have to get this done. If they get hurt again, it'll be time for the Clippers to consider the reality of the fact that those guys can't hold up. And if they get if they don't get the trophy when healthy, then that brings up an entirely different list of concerns. So the Clippers are absolutely under a lot of pressure to get it done this year.